When Jesus was alive on earth, his everyday life looked so much different than ours. You see, Jesus was born into a desert similar to this. Jesus was familiar with dusty paths, with dirty roads, with hot days and cold nights. And so often because the life Jesus lived was so different than the one you and I know, his story can seem so distant, so disconnected. But his story began right here in the desert. John 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and the life was the light of all mankind. That light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus came to the world to be the light and to light up the darkness. But when Jesus came, he did not come in a way that was expected. You see, the people of God, they were waiting for God to send the promised deliverer. All through the Old Testament, we see prophecies about the idea of this Messiah, the one that would come to redeem the people of God back into right relationship with him. They often called this character the Messiah. Maybe you've heard of this term. Messiah simply means the redeemer or the deliverer. And all through the Old Testament, there are many phrases and uh, words that describe the idea of this Messiah. I think one of my favorites is the Hebrew phrase, boker alavat. This Hebrew term, it literally meant the morning without clouds. Again, these were desert people. And they had this idea that when the Messiah would come, the promised deliverer of God, he would be like a morning without clouds, like a beautiful sunrise, that his kingdom would be it's one that lights up the world and it goes from darkness to light. For when the fullness of time came, Jesus began to do things the world had never seen. You see, he spoke of a new kingdom, a kingdom that was rooted in love and in justice. He spoke and when the words came out of his mouth, they said it's like words of living water. When he prayed, miracles happened. When the sick got around him, they got healed. When demons heard his name, they ran in the other direction. And with every message and with every moment, with every miracle, the people began to see that he was something different. They began to murmur, could it be? Could this be the one we've been waiting for, our Messiah? Our Boker Alavot, could it be the one that they called the morning without clouds? And at the exclamation point of his ministry, we see him ask Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter declares, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And after 33 years of life, the people were convinced. Their promised hope had come. Messiah, the morning without clouds was amongst them. All until once again, the unexpected happened. When on that fateful day, Hope came to a halt in the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus was praying with his disciples, sweats of blood dropping down his face. You see, he warned his disciples of what would happen. He told them that he would be taken, that he would die and that he would resurrect, but they didn't understand. That's not what they were looking for. So when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was taken. He was falsely accused, tried before Pilate, and he was given the death of a criminal. They took him out in public. They stripped him naked and they beat him. They bruised him. They mocked him and they ridiculed him all for things that he had never done. After they beat him to about an inch of his life, they put a cross on his back and they made him carry it up the hill of Golgotha. They stretched out his hands as they dug nails into his feet into his hands and they hung him on a cross and there they crucified him. And as his disciples looked on, oh, they were filled with fear and confusion. This was not how it was supposed to be. He was supposed to be the Messiah, the morning without clouds, the beautiful sunrise that would redeem them from destruction. But instead on this day, on Good Friday, as he was murdered before their eyes, 
this sunrise was looking a whole lot more like a sunset, a beautiful life, but one that had come to a crashing end. As his disciples panicked on Golgotha, Jesus hanging on a cross, breathed his last breath. He declared it is finished. And as the sun set, the hope of a morning without clouds died. On a hill in Israel, mercy spoke for me, mercy spoke for me, oh mercy spoke for me, it was on Golgotha's tree, his death brought liberty, his death brought liberty, oh his death brought liberty. Jesus Christ and may I not forget the blood he shed it is by his death I am alive because of Christ I am Now from the sixth hour until the ninth, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked, the rocks were split, and the graves were opened. What is it about darkness that can make us feel so afraid? I remember as a kid, when I would wake up in the middle of the night, in the midst of darkness, fear, it would just strike my heart. I felt alone, I felt afraid, and I knew the only way to feel safe again is if I could just get to my parents' room. And when I was a kid, there was a long hallway that separated my room from my parents. And making that run in the middle of the night, it took all the courage that I had, but something funny happened when I would make it into their room in the middle of the night. You see, I wouldn't have to wake them up. I wouldn't have to make sure they knew I was there. I wouldn't even have to talk to them. All I'd have to do is grab a pillow, lay on the floor, and all of a sudden, I felt safe. You see, the night was still at its darkest, but I knew that I was no longer alone. On Good Friday, when Jesus laid down his life, darkness covered the earth. And for the first time, the disciples were without their Messiah. And they responded a lot like I did as a kid. They felt afraid and alone. Their hope for the morning without clouds had officially died. There were no last minute heroics. There was no angel armies that came to the rescue. And these disciples, they responded how a lot of us do when we feel afraid. They ran, they scattered, they even hid in caves and they wondered if they would ever hear God speak again. The day in between Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday has often been called Silent Saturday. For on this day, Saturday, Jesus was silent. The women had anointed his body and laid him in Joseph's tomb. The cadaver of Christ was as mute as the stone which had covered it. He spoke much on Good Friday. We know that Resurrection Sunday is coming, but on Saturday, Jesus is silent. Easter discussions, they tend to skip Saturday. The resurrection or the crucifixion get all of our attention, but oh, may we never forget what happened on Saturday. 
See, I think a lot of us can relate to Silent Saturday. It's been said that hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I think all of us have experienced moments in life where the things that we hoped for, that we worked for, that they did not work out in the way that we had expected. And we were left feeling a lot like the disciples on Silent Saturday, feeling a lot like I did as a kid in a place of darkness. Although Jesus was silent on earth to his disciples, he was anything but silent on Saturday for on Silent Saturday, Jesus was still working. But the disciples did not realize as they were contemplating the weight of the death of Jesus is that even though he was dead in the flesh, he was alive in the spirit and he went back down and took the keys of death, hell, and the grave. You see, it was in darkness that death was defeated. It reminds me of what the psalmist says, even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid for you are close beside me. May we never forget the importance of Silent Saturday. For it is on Silent Saturday that we are reminded that even when things are the darkest, we are not alone. That even when it feels like the hope of a sunrise has faded, that there is someone still working on our behalf and there is a room at the end of the hallway that we can run to. But for the disciples, they didn't realize what was coming. For them, they were still lost in the midst of a silent Saturday. But the good news is that Sunday is coming. What a humble sacrifice, love that washed me clean, love that washed me clean, oh, love that washed me clean. What a blessed mystery, His punishment, my peace, His punishment, my peace, oh, His punishment, my peace. May May I not forget the blood he shed, it is by his death I am alive, because of Christ I am It was very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, that they went to the tomb. On the way, they were asking each other, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But as they arrived, they looked up and saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled aside. When they entered the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe sitting on the right side. The women were shocked, but the angel said, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. I've always loved a good sunrise. See, sunrises, they're bold, they're bright, and they command the attention of all those who've gotten up early enough to catch its first rays. Maybe that's what I love the most about a sunrise. You see, you rarely see a good sunrise by accident. You can stumble your way into a sunset, but to see a good sunrise, it takes intentionality. And on Resurrection Sunday, just as the sun was rising, it was just a few women who had gotten up before the rest to go visit the tomb. As the sun was making its way over the horizon, the women went to go visit the dead body of Jesus. Now they had long left the hope that he was the morning without clouds. They had with them spices and herbs to take care of the rotting body of Christ. But when they got there, 
oh, what a surprise they found. As they felt those first exclusive sun rays on their skin, they were the first to hear the good news that the sun had risen. Could you imagine being there at that sunrise? On Good Friday, they lost all hope as they watched the sun set on their dreams that Jesus was Messiah. On Silent Saturday, the loss of hope turned to hopelessness as they didn't hear a word from their Savior. But now, here they stand at sunrise at the empty tomb of Jesus. And the words that were said about him, they realized were true all along. He was their Messiah. He was their morning without clouds, but he just did not come in the way they expected. You see, on Good Friday, when Jesus was crucified, it was not hope that died with him, but it was our sin, our shame, and our guilt. On Silent Saturday, when darkness covered the earth, he did not leave them alone, but he was still working on their behalf as he went down and took back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And now here on a resurrection Sunday, like a morning without clouds, he has risen as King of Kings and as Lord of Lords, forever declaring that in him there is still hope. You see, the morning without clouds is not just a cute phrase, but it is our promise that the kingdom of Jesus will always light up every dark night that no matter how unexpected things may feel, no matter how alone we may seem, that we have a promise in Him that the sun will rise, that we can hold on to the anchor of hope. Now, if we're not careful, this word hope, it can sound cheap. In a complex and often painful world, it can sound like a simple Band-Aid we put on problems, but that is not the type of hope Jesus offers. You see, the type of hope Jesus has is one that's been to hell and back. For on Good Friday, hope was fought and forged for at the foot of the cross. On Silent Saturday, hope, it was tested and tried as Jesus went to the darkest place to get it for us. And on Resurrection Sunday, hope proved steadfast and sure at the empty tomb. No matter what we face, no matter how dark life may seem, there is a promise for you and for me. There is a promise of hope in Him. And on this Easter Sunday, in a world that seems dark and scary, with wars and sickness and pain and turmoil everywhere we look, there is still a message of hope. And that hope is not based on emotion or on hype, but that hope is based on the good news of Resurrection Sunday, that there is an empty tomb. There is a morning without clouds. There is a sunrise in your life. On this Easter Sunday, there is still hope.
now to turn to your word. I ask you to help each one of us hear from heaven, speak to our hearts, draw us to Jesus, bring us resurrection life into our lives. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Eric, for that great teaching. You know, hope is an interesting word. In fact, it's a universal world, word. It, it, it's a word that's used around the world to describe, you know, an anticipation of something. And I hope someday as a single person I can get a date and hope maybe I can someday be married and I, I hope maybe my marriage will last a lifetime. I hope. Hope I get a good job. Hope that job is, brings good money. I hope my company stays in business. I hope I don't lose my job. I hope I get that promotion. Man, it'd be good to get that, that promotion in what I do. You know, I hope I, hope I don't get COVID. If I get COVID, I hope it's not bad. Hope I, hope I never get cancer. Hope that doesn't happen. Hope I don't have to go through chemotherapy. I hope. There's lots of hopes. Hope I can get through college in four years. I sure hope so. But you know, hope without a foundation is just a sort of a dream. It's, it's not a reality. The way to turn your hopes into realities, it, it requires a plan. You, you want to get through college, well, there's a plan for that. If you want a promotion at work, there, well, you can have a plan where you get better at what you do, and it'd be an obvious thing that you improve. You want your marriage to get better. It has to go through a plan. I, I've got to learn how to communicate better. We've got to learn how, how to relate to one another. There's a, a plan. See, the ho- kind of hope we talk about in Christ is not a hope without a plan. You see, God has always had a plan for our hopes. Always. And his plan before the foundation of the world was to send his son to die for us, to give his life for us because he knew that when he made us and made us with the free will, we'd all blow it. We'd all go our own ways, do our own thing and hope we'd make out okay. But that hope was hopeless because it had no foundation. But God had this incredible plan and our plan is hope in Jesus. Here's what the Bible says about our, our hope in Jesus Timothy called him our, our hope. Colossians chapter 1, it says Jesus is the hope of glory. In Titus, he's described as our blessed hope. Our, our hope is Jesus. But let's back that up even further. What, what is our hope in Jesus all about? Because history tells us that there was this man, Jesus, that walked on the earth. It's It's not only known within the Christian world, but in the secular world, there was a man named Jesus who was on this earth who was crucified and died. But our hope doesn't rest in that God sent a good man in our place. Our hope is that Jesus is alive. Let's look at what the Bible says. Blessed Be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a, what is that word? Living hope. Now, how did he bring us into this living hope? Well, he says it right there. Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Another translation says we are reborn to experience a living hope energetic hope. How? Through the resurrection. Which means this. Today we celebrate our relationship with God and we celebrate that that it has a foundation in the fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. It's what separates our faith from all other faiths. Mohammed died. Confucius died. All other religious leaders died. And the difference is Jesus also died. But he was raised from the dead and lives today. That's the difference. He was resurrected. 
And our faith is built on that. And so the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, they must have been having some questions about this. They must have been questioning this idea that a man can be resurrected. And so in his letter to the church, he corrects their doctrine. He begins to teach them and, and share with them. Let me show you 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters of Corinth and Kalamazoo, of the good news. Everybody say good news. The good news is the gospel. So we are followers of the gospel. What's the gospel? The gospel is good news. The translation of that means, literally means, really, really, really good news. Like the best news you can hear. So Paul was saying to the church and saying to us today, I've got some really, really, really good news for you. Jesus is alive. That was the message. Not that Jesus walked on water, although he did. Not that he brought sight to blind eyes, although he did. Not that he helped the lame to walk, although he did. The news was what? He is alive. That's the gospel. He said, let me remind you of the good news. I preached to you before. You welcomed it, and you still stand firm in it. Why? It's our foundation. The, the gospel the resurrection of Jesus is the foundation of which we stand. It is this good news, this gospel, that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. So what's he saying? He's directly answering their questions. Was this really true? Did Jesus really rise from the dead. Let's continue with this chapter. I passed on to you what was most important. This is most important. There are, there are a lot of things we learn about life through Scripture, a lot of things we learn about life through Jesus Christ. But the most important thing we learn is he's alive. So, I passed it on to you. Cry. Now listen to this. Here's what he passed on. What was passed on to him. Okay, here it is. You ready? This is the gospel. You say, well, what's the gospel? Here it is. Here it is. Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. How did he die? We all know he was crucified. Now, let's talk about that. He was crucified. He was killed by experts at killing people. Crucifixion was not just something where they hung somebody on a cross and then waited to see what happened. No, it was a horrible death. First, they beat the prisoner to, as Eric said in the video, inches of his death. Then they nailed him to the cross to allow him to ultimately be suffocated. They had to hold their bodies up because as soon as they began to fall their bodies they couldn't breathe and then finally they would suffer and die a horrible death that's why when they wanted to speed up the crucifixion they would break the legs of those that were being crucified so they could no longer hold themselves up they came to break the legs of the two men on either side of Jesus and Jesus on that hill that day and when they came they realized that Jesus was already dead. So they broke the legs of the other two, allowed them to die, and then they took a spear and they thrust it into the side of Jesus and broke into the, hit the sack that, covered, or that surrounded his heart and blood and water came out. There was no question. Jesus was dead. He was dead. Let's keep reading. He was buried. Again, you know the story. Joseph of Arimathea, a very wealthy man, a man of influence in the Jewish community, well known. He had a burial plot that he had purchased. It was a location. He owned it. He had the title for it. It was his. It was marked for him. So there was an actual place they took the body. Now, when they took the body there, the Roman government wanted to make sure that no one messed with the body. So they took a stone and they, they, they rolled it over it, and then they put the Roman seal over it. Now, why is that important? Because the Roman seal said this property, 
Joseph is no longer yours. It now belongs to Rome forever. Don't touch the seal. Jesus died. He was killed by people who were experts at murdering people, and he was buried in another man's tomb. Number three, but here's the good news of the gospel. And he was, say it with me, raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. We call that being resurrected. What is resurrection? It means you were alive, you died, you were made alive again to never die again. That's the resurrection. And that's what he wants to share with all of us. That's the life he wants for us. That we identify with his death, we identify with his burial, and we identify with his resurrection life that he brings for all of us. Let's keep reading the scripture. He was seen by Peter, and then by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James, that's his brother, and later by all the apostles. And last of all, listen to this, though I was born at the wrong time, Paul says, I also saw him. Why is that important? Well, again, we're, we're saying that our faith totally rests on Jesus being resurrected, on Jesus being alive. Paul just said, hey, there's over 500, as I write this, there are over 500 people who, will, who can who, who um, will acknowledge this, they were eyewitnesses to him being alive. They saw the, the scars in his hands, on his feet, and his side. They saw him. And if I'm telling a lie, they could stand up right here and say, that's not true. But it is true. He is alive. He is alive. Let's keep reading. But tell me this. Since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? He now gets into why the questions they're asking. For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. One translation says, all our preaching is like smoke and mirrors. We've been lying to you the whole time. Let's keep reading. And if we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the dead, but that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. Let's keep reading. And if Christ has not been raised that not only is our preaching useless, your faith is useless, and you're still guilty of your sins. And in that case, all who have died believing, those who saw him and, and died, if that's all not true, then they are in Christ are all lost. But let's keep reading. And if our hope, everybody say hope. If our hope, if our foundation for living in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. But in fact, let's say all this together. Ready? Are these last words. You ready? One, two, three. Christ has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Amen. You see, that's the message. That's the foundation. You see, it is true. He is Alive, and because he's alive, we can live. Resurrection, I was alive, but died, but made alive, and to die never again. That's the message of Jesus Christ to all of us. That's the blessed hope. That's why he, he is our hope. But you know, when I think about people, I think about people who live like it's Thursday. You know, life's good. I've got a good job. My marriage isn't great, but it's okay. My kids, well, they're crazy, but they're all right. They're going to make it. I got a little money set aside. I, I got a nice home. I, I got a pretty good car. In fact, the home prices are really rising up. I'm, I'm doing better than I 
I thought I would. I kind of like this. I, yeah, I'm, I'm spinning, spinning a lot of plates, but I'm good. I don't really, really need God. Jesus, you know, you do your thing. You be you, Jesus. Whatever it is you do, you do that. I'm good. They're, they're thirsty people. But y- y- we weren't made to live like thirsty people. But Friday comes. You know, thirsty people say, I just hope nothing changes. But how many know life is like carrying a bucket of water? It's just sloshing all over. There's always changing. Life's always changing. But come, come Friday, what you've never expected, it, it happens. What? My spouse just told me they don't love me anymore. What? My kids just decided they're going to go a different lifestyle. What? Doctor says, I got what? I got, I got cancer? I got cancer? How'd that, how'd that happen? We were, Thursday was good. Oh, what, what happened to Friday? What happened today? Who, who, who died? My, my friend died? Oh my gosh. The last time we talked, we argued, and now they're gone. I didn't. I didn't expect Friday to come. Man, I, I hope I can get through this day. See, there are Friday people that are here right now. You're wondering, how am I going to get through today? But then there's Saturday. You know, when you're a Friday person, you, you gather all your friends and family around, and you, you encourage one another, and you, you hope you can get through it. But then Saturday comes, and as Eric said, you know, things get, get quiet. Saturday, it's silent. You don't, you don't hear anything. God, what, what, what happened? I was going along. Thursday was awesome. But then Friday came, and now Saturday, I don't hear a thing from you. What's, what's going on? God, where, where are you? I, I thought you were my foundation. I I thought you said, Jesus, if you built your life on the rock, that the storms would come and nothing would happen. But you don't hear anything. Why why is that? Well, because Jesus didn't change what he said. He said, you build your life on me. I'm not leaving you. I'll never forsake you. I'll never never leave you. I don't need to tell you that again. I'm right with you. I don't know about you, but I found God does some of his best work on a Saturday. Say, why is he talking? Because he's working. He's working on your behalf. He's setting things up. And why is that? Because everything he did, he did for you. Everything he did, he didn't do for Thursday. He didn't do it for Friday. He didn't do it for Saturday. He did it for Sunday. Because your life is a resurrected life. Your life is a Sunday life. That's the life we build our foundation from. I don't know what you're building your foundation from, but I ain't building it on Thursday. I ain't building it on the Fridays that come into my life or the Saturdays that come into my life. I'm setting my ground on Sunday morning, on Resurrection Sunday. He is alive, and he's on my side, and he'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He'll he'll fight our battles for us. Why? Because he already has and carries the scars of victory on his back and in his hands and in his feet and in his heart. He's on our side. He's for you, and he'll never give up on you. I'm here to tell you on this Easter resurrection morning, there's still hope. Let's pray. Father, we declare that you are the God of all hope. And we choose to put our feet securely on the grounds of that promise. That you are our God and you are alive. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. Amen. Can we show our appreciation to my dad? What a great word, great reminder. There is still hope. Anybody grateful for Jesus this Easter Sunday? Man, so good. Well, listen, as we, as we close service, I just want to come, and I want to help lead us in a prayer. Uh, one final prayer before we wrap our service up today, and that is to help all of us in the room to encounter 
this hope, to experience him. As it was shared, Jesus, he is the foundation of our life. Everything, all this hope we've talked about, it starts in a personal relationship with him. And maybe you've walked in today on Easter Sunday. Maybe you were invited or maybe this is kind of the thing that you do around this time of year. But right now in your life, you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus. And you're hearing about him, hearing about hope in your heart, I believe has been stirred. And I want to lead us as we end service uh, this morning in a prayer, simply to invite Jesus into our life. The Bible says that if we confess with our mouth, if we believe in our heart, the Lord Jesus, that we would be saved, that we would encounter that hope, that our sins, they would be forgiven, that we would have a promise of eternity in heaven, but even better, we could experience heaven here in him on earth. And so with every head bowed and eyes closed, if you don't mind, just for a moment, I just want to speak to you if you're here today and Jesus isn't the Lord of your life. I mean, if you are unsure in any way, have any doubt in your mind whether or not your relationship with God is in a right place, we can resolve that today. Maybe you at one point walked with him, that you were a Christian, but since things have happened in life that you've taken some steps away and you've taken a different path, well, today is a great day to come on home. And in just a moment, I'm going to lead all of us. We're going to pray this all together in a simple prayer, doing what the Bible says, confess with our mouth, believe in our heart. And in that moment, I believe God is going to meet people in this room with an experience of his hope and even more, eternal life change. So every head bowed, every eye closed in the room. If that's you today, Jesus isn't the Lord of your life, can I invite you today to pray this prayer with us? To say, Eric, I'm gonna decide today to be a follower of Jesus. I'm coming back to him. No one's looking around, but I just wanna know who we're praying for. And then we're going to all pray together. So when I count to three, can I encourage you just to lift your hand if that's you? You're saying, Eric, that's me. I already see hands going up. I haven't even counted. God's already working. See hands. One, two, three. Let's do it. Hands are going up all across the room. Today, people just saying, yep, today's my day, baby. I'm coming home. Jesus, you're Lord of my life. I'm going to, I'm going to make that decision today. There's still time. If you want to shoot your hand up, say, Eric, include me in that prayer. I want to be sure. I want to be sure of my relationship with him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, church family, can we all pray this together? If your hand's in the air, say these words after me. And I believe this morning you're going to encounter forgiveness, love, grace, and the hope that's in Christ. Let's all say this. Say, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me. Right now, I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord. From this day forward, I choose, I decide to follow you. I am a Christian. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, praise the Lord. Can we put our hands together and thank the Lord?